So I'm here today. This is more of a dialogue um, than a talk because I really want to, you can see I have my notebook out and I have many blank pages. So I'd really like to hear from you um, about what stories you think would be interesting, important, valuable in some way to be seen by the general public on television, and how you might tell that. So um, just as a little bit of context, the hardest thing that I've probably had to learn, and I think that any television producer and a science producer has to learn, is the difference between topic and story. A topic is comprised of a number of interesting facts. It's kind of linear. It's sort of a list. Now, television programs can be a list. And you've probably seen many yourself or many articles, 10 top ideas that change the world, for example. So that's kind of one of our favorite cliches. And that is something that indeed is possible to turn into a television program. But the best kind of programs, and I think the best science programs, are ones that actually tell a story. So what is it that a story means? We discussed it in my first talk um, a little bit. A story means a narrative that unfolds so that the end is not predictable from the beginning. It's not simply telling you 10 great facts about nanotechnology or 10 really super people who do experiments in nanotechnology or material science or any one of a number of topics. But it unfolds as a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has conflict in it, it has drama in it, it has excitement in it, and you simply don't wind up in the same place where you started, and it's somewhat surprising to the audience. A story is the hardest thing to define, but all of us know it when we read something or go to see a movie. What do you say when you, if you loved it, that was a great story. And you know exactly what you mean, although you may not be able to define it. We've all been to what's called the McKee Story Seminar, which is you pay, um, this is the words of wisdom of a screenwriter, kind of a failed screenwriter, I have to say, named Robert McKee. And he tells, he instructs screenwriters um, on what's called the three-part story structure, which dates all the way back to the ancient Greeks, which is conflict, climax, resolution. And it makes a very neat little package. And for many, many, many years, this was really how I structured stories. Because when you go to one of these um, one of these story seminars, you start on a Friday night, and you know you're really tired, you've been working all day, you've paid a lot of money from this. And the first thing, and McKee is mean. I, this is as close to, I've never been to an S seminar or anything, or science hall, or anything like that. But I would imagine this is as close as it gets to that. He first of all tells you that if your cell phone rings, you have to come up and give him $20. And he collects a lot of $20, and you wouldn't dare not to give it to him. If you whisper a talk and he catches you, he kicks you out of the room. He's a mean, mean guy. And, um, and he thinks very little of his audience, which is kind of the perfect setup to get you to really become an acolyte of his point of view. He ends up doing an analysis of the movie, frame by frame analysis of the movie Casablanca. <laughs> and from an Aristotelian point of view. Now, I don't really know anything about an Aristotelian point of view. I'm just a television producer. Maybe you'd know. But it is extremely erudite and amazing. And when you get out and you get home, you feel like you have to tell your spouse about it in hours long detail <laughs> until you see their eyeballs roll back into their head. You know what I mean when you just 
feel like you're in the presence of something that really clicks for you in a deep and profound way. Oh, was that someone's cell phone? Twenty dollars. <laughs> you can do it. I can do it. Um, anyway, so con so the first third of the film is conflict. You have to have that your character. You have to get your character in trouble and keep them there. That's what happens. Climax, the story just has to come to some kind of a head, which is going to make the whole floor fall out under your, under your character. And then resolution, you have to get to they lived happily ever after. Because really, nobody wants to see a sad or tragic science film. Do they? <laughs> so the question is, what you're probably saying is, OK, that sounds great for a movie or some feature, uh, feature film. But how does this really work for science? And, but when you really think about it, it does actually work great. And if you think about the movie The Proof that we saw uh, part of that in my first talk about how Andrew Wiles um, solved um, Proof for Matt's Last Theorem, you can see that he is that he is engaged in a terrible conflict with himself in the first part about whether he can do this. He starts off with a childlike belief, fascination with Fermat's last theorem. Then he actually solves it, but his solution, his proof turns out to be wrong. That was perfect. The floor falls out from under him. And then, of course, he lived, he, he solved it again, proved it again, and he certainly has lived happily ever after, at least we hope, after spending seven years of his life doing this. Yes? I don't deny that such stories exist in science, uh -huh. but that's, I don't think, the norm. And don't we run the danger of, I don't know, confusing archaeology with Indiana Jones if we do that? Um, you know, I think you have another pathway in your mind. You know, you have you know both the rational and the emotional pathways in your mind. So your storytelling pathway is really looking to try to emotionally engage the viewer. But the rational part of your mind says this has to be correct. This has to be true to reality. Um, this has to be accurate. We can't um, bend the facts to tell a good story much as you want to. So you're looking at it with kind of two eyes, your, journal, your two hats, your journalist hat and then your filmmaker hat. And so I agree with you. You know, uh, and scientists hate being turned into actors, and I can't blame them. Once the, one of the first films I made was called The Gene Engineers on recombinant DNA after Silomar way back in 1978. And I really didn't know what I was doing. And I directed the Nobel laureate Paul Berg. And he really got mad at me because he felt that I was turning him into an actor, and he didn't like it. I don't think I was. I think I was just trying to get him to really speak in a way that the audience could follow and understand and engage with. Um, but that was certainly a story about conflict, a time when a group of biologists believed, you know, had come up with a brilliant new technology to splice DNA, and yet they themselves feared that this technology could do great harm. Turned out, of course, that it couldn't, and now it's one of the major paradigm shifts and advances in biological science of our time. But at that time, we didn't know that that's, that that's how it would be, that, that most of their fears would be groundless. So the idea is, and I think to say what you're, what, to take your point, and then we're going to talk about some stories, is that it all comes with the story choice. One, before I took this job as executive producer of NOVA, the guy who had been, John Angier, who had been the executive producer who, uh, of NOVA, had been my boss as a, as a NOVA producer when I started as just a production assistant. He said to me, in this job, 
you really don't have that much to do, which I don't know how he did it, but that didn't turn out to be. But you have a few really super important decisions to make every year. And those are the shows that you're going to make. And if you make a mistake on those decisions, you are really going to suffer for it because you have to live with it for a long time because these shows take a year or more to make. So it is true. And a lot of programs that have a very hard time being born, um, it's because the topic was not properly vetted or because we thought the story was one thing and it turned out to be another or because it turned out that there was not too much story at all. And unfortunately, sometimes you don't know that until you've gotten deeply into the research. In the old days, when we had tons of money, if we started research on a film and it didn't really turn out to pan out, that the story wasn't what we thought it was and we didn't feel it was doable, we could dump it. But now we have to salvage pretty much everything. And um, I can just tell you that you have a very sinking feeling when you know that you're heading into something that really is not going to work as a subject. Now, occasionally that's because you just run into a situation where the science is just so difficult that it's just daunting and that figuring out a way to tell the story is just extremely difficult. But usually with those kinds of stories, we can, usually, we can usually make our way through it with a lot of help from our scientist advisors and a lot of use of metaphor. But um, sometimes, often, something turns out to be just a topic, just kind of a list, and it's just kind of boring. And that doesn't mean that people won't want to watch it, because people who are really interested in the topic might. Um, but it won't be a good film, even if people watch it. Yes? But there are other ways to tell a story. For example, a common one is a flashback. Mm -hmm. So the way that builds interest is quite different, because you sort of know the outcome frequently. If they were to find out the background. Well, I that would be appropriate yeah. for some science stories, I would think, because people have seen the things or know about consequences of certain technological developments. Mm -hmm. But how it came about is an uh, interest. Right. And I, I, to take your point, I think almost all of the stories that we tell are flashbacks because we are seldom following developments prospectively because it's simply too much of a risk. And because if you don't know how it's going to turn out, often you don't know if it's going to turn out or whether there's a story. So I'll give you a, um, but the thing is, you can't really assume that the public knows it. Uh, the people in the field might know it. And so we almost all, but that's a small number of people, not often, even though our audience is an educated audience that follows science, I've actually never had a complaint that said, you know what, I knew this story. Why did you tell it to me as though I didn't know it? I've gotten all kinds of complaints from people, as you can imagine. But for example, in my next talk, my final talk on June 25th, I'll be talking about controversy in science. And one of the topics that we're going to cover is the controversy over evolution, which is not so much a controversy within science as it is a controversy between science and the almost half of the American public who does not really believe in Darwinian evolution. And we told the story in 2007 about a trial that took place in Dover, Pennsylvania in 2005. And of course, the outcome was well known. It had been all over the New York Times, everything. We told it from the perspective that you don't know the outcome from, of this. And so, and again, no one complained. And I, I'm sure some of the people who knew this, who watched the program actually and it took, this was a two hour program, so it took like a long time to kind of get to the end of it um, when you finally found out Judge Jones's ruling. And that doesn't seem, I think that even people who 
might know about it are willing to suspend their knowledge for a little while to um, because they're engaged and involved in the story. And of course, that's our goal, is to make them do that. But to your point, of course, there are many different ways to tell a story. And one thing that I was going to say is the three-part structure has now fallen out of fashion because you have audiences that have much less of an attention span. Everybody is, you know, when we started broadcasting almost 40 years ago, you know, people had a lot of time. Um, the family sat down around the television set and watched the show together. Now families have a television set for every person and the kids are watching on the computer or doing Facebook or whatever. And I'm not saying we still have a lot of families that view together and of course that's indeed what we want. But very few people, if you think, if any of you watch television, if you think of your own viewing habits, you have your computer on your lap, probably. Um, you may be folding laundry. You might have the TV on in the kitchen when you're cleaning up after dinner. Everybody is multitasking. People are telling us, you know what? I don't want to wait till the end of the story to know what happens. I need to know up front that this story is worth an hour of my time. These audiences are tough. I need to know that. And of course, when you go, I don't know if you've ever had experience with focus groups, but they're a nightmare. And you know, a bunch of people who will give up their evening to get $75 and a slice of pizza um, go in and they love to cut what you do to shreds. So you kind of, if you're watching from the other side of a one made mirror, you get to see your life's work torn apart by a bunch of people you don't even know. And frankly, you kind of hate and disdain after a while. But they're your public. So um, usually when we do focus groups, we divide them into people who always watch Nova and there's nothing we can do wrong. They love everything we do. We love them people who sometimes watch NOVA, and those, of course, are the people that we're most anxious to listen to, and people who say they will never watch NOVA, <laughs> and we would like to understand why. And all of these people are sort of remotely within our demographic, at kind of around the educational level, income level, it's, well, usually not income level, because PBS viewers a lot of money, but, um, but, and you can't get those people to go to a focus group for an evening. And so, but they tell us, you need to tell me something at the beginning. Give me a taste of what I'm going to learn so I know. And that caused us to move away from the key story structure and more into an episodic structure, which if you look at the evolution of our shows, if anybody's interested enough to do that, you can see that we're still doing that, but we're trying to shoe hold, shoehorn it in to some kind of concept of a story. And to kind of and this is a new thing for us. I don't think we're completely there yet, but it's an attempt to accommodate what the um, what the attention span of the American public is now. So those are the things that I think are important. Storytelling. What how are you just not going to make this a list of ideas? Second of all, visuals. It's got to have some kind of visual possibility. You actually have to be able to see something in the show and not all with animation. Because if you have all animation, it, and I'm talking especially about graphic animation, the kind we saw in Encyclopedia Britannica films in high school, not that much fun to watch. Animation that's a metaphor, um, that is um, imaginative, that's also very expensive. So you have to figure out what, um, whether you have the money. So it needs to have visuals, it needs to have a story, and it needs to have characters. People that the audience, people like to watch shows about people. Um, and so it needs to have a char characters that you can engage with whose thinking process you can understand. 
Because a program like NOVA, we're not interested in presenting science as a bunch of, answer, of answers. Kind of, we're delivering, you're so lucky because we're delivering truth to you all tied up in a pretty package. We want it to be as messy as possible because that's where the drama is. And then we'd like to tie it in a knot through the intellectual process of the character. So those are kind of the thing that when producers come to pitch me or scientists pitch me or we get ideas in from the public or from other journalists or from reading them in the New York Times or the New Yorker magazine, we're always saying, okay, what's the story here? What's the story? There's nothing wrong with starting with the topic, but you have to move on to what's the story? What am I going to see? And probably the most important question of all, why should I care? Well, what relevance does this have to me? Now, that doesn't mean for our audience that the relevance has to be that this is going to be a great new um, washing machine that's going to wash the clothes in uh, four minutes instead of 15. I, I don't think our audience has a utilitarian view of science at all. I don't think, in fact, our audience hates science you can use. They hate health programming. If I want sure death, I put on a medical program. They do not want to see it. We have a largely male audience. They do not want to watch programs about cancer and Alzheimer's disease. I don't exactly know why. And when we do medical programs, our, the female part of our audience, as we say, we have our business manager always says, yes, we have a lot of female viewers, but they're actually like men which is probably a sexist thing for me to say, but I think it's so funny that I always, that I always say. So when we did, for example, Cracking Your Genetic Code about personalized medicine at the end of March, it was a lovely program, very high female viewership. Very, the men abandoned it in droves. They want to see it. So, um, and I know, you know, I have a husband. I see him clicking around and surfing, and he's like, yuck. You know, I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to watch programs about sick people. So, and that's one of the constants that we that we have to deal with. But I really, what I really want in this session is I'd love to hear about some of your ideas, and I'd like to I'll kind of press you if you have some topic ideas, some story ideas, and I'll push you to work with me to develop them into some kind of story. So you can see some of the process that we go through. And I can tell you one thing, it often takes me at least, um, and my team, a long time from getting an idea to when we make a decision to actually go with it. Because we know that it's a good idea, and it's something new, it's something hot, um, it's something important. We really like the scientists that it involves. Can't figure out how to tell the story. And sometimes those things just take a lot of time, and there's nothing you can do about it. You've got to mull it over and think it over and read a lot of articles on it and try to sort out a way to tell a story. I've been sitting on this uh, show on cybersecurity, which I really want to do. I like the producers. I know that they know a lot about it. I've been sitting on it for about eight months now. And in fact, now, of course, the story has moved on and left us behind, but just can't figure out how to tell the story. Anyway, you have an idea, which I'd love to hear. I don't know. Maybe it's already been used. But I think That's the story of graphene uh -huh. is remarkable. It's the Cinderella story. Mm -hmm. It's a material which uh, presumed not to exist. Uh -huh. People find it a very low tech, you know, scotch tape thing, and boom, I mean, thousands of papers, Nobel Prize, I mean, and uh, technological promise. Mm -hmm. I think it has all the elements you want. Uh huh. So, do you think graphene is a story that um, it did it make it been, in? Has it been uh, already uh, uh, featured in the Nobel? It may it was a, about a six-minute segment in our series on material science making stuff. So the question is, does graphene make an hour-long documentary? Is it a short, shorter piece? Or is it something that you put in a context of a larger documentary with a bigger, with a bigger, bigger story area? What do you think? Well, I mean, you can, if you want to tell it as a story, you can make it as long as you want. Uh -huh. So there's some uh, 
uh, as I said, uh, we know all, all sorts of carbon materials, mm -hmm. but this was sort of magically missing. Mm -hmm. People were sort of didn't believe it existed or could be made. Uh -huh. So just give me a little bit of the once upon a time story here. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm not a storyteller. That's okay. Uh, uh, so I'll fill in the blanks. I, I just I'm asking you because I think it will be instructive, and other people who know about the graphene story can chime in. Let's see if we can, as an exercise, let's see if we can flesh this out. Um, you know, here I'm thinking, okay, one development within a bigger field, how do I blow this up into a story? So I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit more about, you say, magical twists and turns. Tell me some of them, or someone else who you want to talk. Do you all know this story? Was there controversy about the Nobel Prize work too? That could be a. Uh huh. Oh yeah, so I guess there's also tension about who really discovered it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, several people hoping to, you know, to be acknowledged, and uh -huh. maybe not all of them got. I mean, I think still it was a fair decision by the Nobel Committee, but still. So uh -huh. there's this kind of personal tension there as well. Right. Um, and now, as I said, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an enormous... So, it, you know, the key from, to what you're saying to me is there was something missing and no one could find it. And so can someone tell me more about that? Because that's where I look for the story. That's where I look at so here's right. something that... I think that's, the way yeah. is to look at it from dimensionality. We have, you know, carbon. So, so, so graphene is, of course, made up of carbon. And we know, you know, simple carbon like diamond and graphite, you know, Mm -hmm. Asian time. Mm -hmm. And then I think, in, so someone in the expert correct me how the nanotubes come in, 1980, 70? Uh, uh, 91, I think. Yeah, right, okay. So so, so then, um, of course, there's the boom of you know, getting device smaller and smaller and nanotechnology. And then I think in the 990s, as the expert said, there is discovery of 1D structure, you know, nanotubes. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, you go up. Mm -hmm. um, the two, but then they, they can even get down to a different size, you know, different depth, and then and then you can think of if you have you know a sheet, a, a, a tube is a small thing, so you, you can you can blow it up, then you in the limit <coughs> you know, to, these, to this structure, mm -hmm. but that is not discovered until when graphene is two thousand. Right, and I, in terms of visuals, you can I mean uh, this uh, another name for this uh, carbon structure is fullerenes, right? So it's mm -hmm. uh, right, right. It's related to this. So there is also zero uh, related to buckyballs. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. No, so that's the zero depth. So there is zero D, which is the buckyball, and then one D, which is the nanotube, and then three D, which is Asian the graphite. But somehow the two D, which you just get from you know having a tube of you know infinite diameter, that's somehow that's somehow missing. Mm -hmm. right. What I don't understand. You know, What's missing? The, the two, the graphene is the 2D, right? Mm -hmm. Graphite is 3D structure of carbon, mm -hmm. and then the buckyball is kind of you can think of it as a zero-dimensional thing, right? Because it's, all the dimensions are small, right? Mm -hmm. it's just ball, small mm -hmm. dimension, and then then to extend in one direction, right? So it's a 1D, and then the 2D is missing. Mm -hmm. The gra the graphene, which is 2D, oh, I see. is missing. And so everyone thinks that you should be able to find this or create this, right? Maybe you don't know the story how it was discovered. Yeah, I don't. Ah, okay, so let me tell you, it's fantastic. Okay, good. I'm all ears. Uh, because this is a nanotechnology. It's mm -hmm. making an uh, atomically thin layer. Mm -hmm. And you know how it was made? With mm -hmm. scotch tape. Yeah, oh, I've seen that, yes. Right? Right. It's extremely low-tech solution, and it worked. Amazingly, uh -huh. it worked. <coughs> uh -huh. And how we discovered it, how we uh, detected it in the lab, by looking into it mm -hmm. with a bear, with basically uh, low, you know, ordinary optical microscope, mm -hmm. because the condition was just so uh, happened mm -hmm. to be like all the stars were aligned. We used the correct substrate. We, used mm -hmm. the, we, saw, we saw it with the naked eye. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing. You can see atoms, basically atomic uh, things. You can make them with, uh, you know, in a school lab. Well, not really, but okay. And then see it with, with you know, a uh, hundred dollar microscope. And so, and what's the implication of that? The implication is this material has uh, so many superlative points. It's like the strongest material on Earth. It's I don't know how many times stronger than steel. It conducts electricity very well. It's structurally perfect in small systems. Mm -hmm. 
um, uh, it conducts heat uh, as one of the best heat conductors, so it may be solution for all these things mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, in uh, electronics and you know, heat management. Um, Let me challenge you on that. I uh, mean, come on, graphite. We, we, the problem is it conducts really well in the plane, but it doesn't conduct yeah. well in three dimensions. And you don't need to. And I've heard so many people, yeah, yes, you do need to get the third dimension. And, well, and you make I've trip. heard so many people talk about about nano uh, nanotubes and buckyballs and, and everything, and they're just which is just as strong as graphene, by the way, right? No, no, the buckyballs never deliver. There's lots of hype about buckyballs and nanotubes we never deliver. Precisely. <laughs> so here's our conflict. Right. Here's our conflict. Yes. Yeah, I so, just want to say there are a couple of other dimensions. The the guy that discovered this, Andre Gein, mm -hmm. is a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's actually quite interesting. He's a interesting person. Mm -hmm. Where is he? Uh, he's based. He's now in England, mm -hmm. but he was based in Holland before that. He's Russian, <coughs> original. He got the Ig Nobel Prize. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. He got both Ig Nobel Prize and Ig Nobel Prize. He's a fascinating, guy. He's a fascinating individual. So I think that's what part of uh -huh. what you're looking for. Iconoclastic. Uh -huh. uh, otherwise, he would never happen on this, I think. Um, the other dimension is that some applications are already appearing for example, flexible monitors. You know, you can mm -hmm. display like your flat screen was an improve was a revolution over the old tube-based TV. But you can always you can already have materials that are flexible on which you can mm -hmm. display images. Mm -hmm. Some of these things are even stuck in magazines already. And I mean, the, pot the potential is there, and people are. The potential why, is there people, for a kind of for, no, for of applications app that lots are. Lots of applications, and that's mm -hmm. why there's so much money going into the research, not just in the academia, but also in mm -hmm. industry. Right. Uh, it's, so, going but, to, it's going to be a big industry, mm -hmm. and you can see that. You don't know exactly. Right. Exactly what it'll be. But, you, but of course, when we do a show, we want there to be applications that will change the world in a way, and that will be uplifting, not just another consumer product that we can, that people will make a bundle on. Okay. How about this application? Yeah. I don't, okay. I, I don't know the exact story, but uh, uh, Antonio Castroneta was telling me that uh, graphene is uh, biocompatible. It's carbon. Mm -hmm. And so he was telling me about a doctor who was using graphene to connect uh, this little camera mm -hmm. uh, to the blind people retina. So the graphene well, is helping what, to blind people what we like. see again. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. How about that? Uh, that's that's not the thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another it's angle, it's con medical. another connection actually. Oh, it's medical, unfortunately. Right. Another connection <laughs> We're not to, say that to, to, to other physics is that uh, graphene has this funny property that it, uh, electrons in there behave like relativistic particles. Mm -hmm. So if you lose their mass, electrons mm -hmm. magically lose their mass. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? And then behave as, you know, sort of like mimic mm -hmm. the behavior of, you know, ultra high energy particles. Uh -huh. Well, not really, but, you know. I have to say, you're really intriguing me. As far as applications are concerned, I mean, this is not the question when people like Nova have to figure out how to do this. I, I granted there is no shortage of super cool applications that people have proposed for graphene, and there's an unbelievable hype in the field. Right. I personally think 99% of this is oversold, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you now jump on that bandwagon. Do you think bandwagon. nanotubes are oversold and uh, buckyballs? And well, there's a lot of things. You can say a nanotube is an unbelievably strong material, which is true if you look at a single nanotube, but a single nanotube is very small and it can't help much of a weight. So you need to make a big mm -hmm. fiber or cable with this thing, and that's not nearly as stable as you can't just scale it up. <laughs> there's lots of lots of things that people, or if I take this application and make people see, I mean, there's a lot more you need for a retina than something that I've mentioned. 
-hmm. And my fear is when, and these things have happened before and before and before, that you, you, you go over the hype, you oversell something, you increase expectations of people into like the next miracle thing, and it's going to fall through. And if this happens over and over and over again, people are going to lose their faith in science. Yes, this is not right. how science works, okay? Let people figure out whether the hype delivers before you say, we have the next miracle coming around the corner. There's a lot of stuff that is amazing and cool about graphene, but it's, I don't know, I don't think it is that I might be able to see in 10 years. I would clearly not use these applications to excite people. Mm -hmm. So I can see there's a lot of conflict in this topic too, which I think is, is actually good. And I really think your point about when things are hyped up through applications, <coughs> I think that what our audience really likes and what I really like is not just hyping topics through, through applications. What I meant was uplifting is that they really advance knowledge and understanding. Our audience is different from other audiences because they're not that wowed by Jibu's gadgets. What they are wowed about is adding to the state of knowledge. We're very lucky to have such a, an audience that is as deep as that. It really is wonderful, but we have to satisfy that. So okay, so do you think they'd be interested in the connection to the graphic vision? To what? Yeah, so, so, so that is so that is part of my worry mm -hmm. because when you talk about you know how I mean, to read the electrons, about, know, like, have you seen one the electron? When you talk about how the electronic graphene looks like the you know, high energy particle, uh, there's a tendency of that being you know cartoonish presentation in the uh, popular science would have community that that suggest yes. too much. <laughs> well, people yeah. would tend to really believe that there is some, you know, behind you physics you can, you know. I don't know, it should be an answer. They, 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 they draw, to they draw an equation of the, what the, the electrons in the graphene is and the uh -huh. elementary particle is, and that is an easy trap that you can get into. I mean, there's a limit to how deep you can go in this, but I do think that our audience is most interested in the basic science and how this, if it does bring about any kind of a paradigm shift or really grow the understanding, that's what they're most interested in more than Jiva's applications, although that would naturally be a part of the program too. Well, if you'd be happy to tell a bit more of the theory side of the story, then the story starts 50 or 60 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And you would say, once upon a time, there was a theoretician, the name of which escapes me, unfortunately, <laughs> who got curious into the behavior of two-dimensional materials and started to do some calculations okay. on stuff such as two-dimensional carbon. And he found the, all these amazing properties that this material would have, and everyone else would laugh and would say, yeah, two-dimensional stuff, we're never going to be able to make that. And But then 50 years later, someone made that stuff, and indeed mm -hmm. all these behaviors are there. It's really true. But it took 50 years to sort of, in that sense, verify that that, that theoretical idea wasn't just all just pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. But but I mean, when people now go ahead, look, we have this material, we found all these things. The truth really is there was known for 50 years it would have that stuff. The only thing we didn't have is this it's the stuff. stuff in our hands. Yeah, that makes a great story because then you close the loop at the end. Yeah, but the unfortunate thing is that the person who figured out all of this stuff, I can't even remember the name of that guy. Well, so you were saying it was Williams, Williams and I've seen Ansager had notes about mm -hmm. the behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, Wallace, what I'm talking about. Wallace. 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 Yeah, we're, we're going to have a rapid response workshop, a two-week workshop next December mm -hmm. on what, one aspect of it, which is related to the Dirac equation, which a special application which was discovered or predicted by Majorana many years ago. It's also an interesting character, mm -hmm. historically. Mm -hmm. uh, a kind, he predicted there could be a kind of elementary particle that's never been seen. But it seems that its analog in some solids may exist. And there, right now, there's controversy about the experimental results. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe by December it will be resolved. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's an area where we're investing mm -hmm. intellectually here. Mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think this is going to go away in a mm -hmm. short time. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's so you think it's a rich subject that could... It's a great subject. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, at, from the point of view of principle, mm -hmm. even if the applications are overhyped, 
which may or may not be the case. Uh, from the point of view of principle, there's a great deal of interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who has another idea? Yeah. So you've had these um, two Brian Green specials on, right. on the unification of gravity or the conflict between mm -hmm. gravity and quantum mechanics, which I guess have been successful. Mm -hmm. And you've enjoyed working with Brian, I understand. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one piece of the story, which for some reason he's never told, but it's, it's, had, it's, it's a sort of had a big impact, which is um, in 1976, Stephen Hawking wrote this paper saying that if you look at quantum mechanics near black holes, it, it breaks, it fails. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fundamentals of quantum mechanics fail. And this is something which pretty much everyone who works in this field of gravity and energy physics has mm -hmm. felt compelled to think about. And Steve and Marty and I have each spent lots of time trying to find Hawking's mistake and failing. And, um, and and really over the years, what's I mean the, the consensus that formed is that um, something has to something radical has to happen. So that this that this thought experiment of Hawking points to something very radical, uh, not necessarily the failure of quantum mechanics, but maybe a radical change in how we think about space time. Mm -hmm. And um, so wait, let me just get it straight. So you agree or disagree with Hawking that agree, that that quantum mechanics breaks down? I agree that. Well, I agree that his thought experiment says that something fundamental has to break down, but but not on what breaks down. Mm -hmm. Well, Hawking disagrees with Hawking. Well, right, right. So <laughs> Hawking honestly recanted, but there right. is no good explanation uh, given for his recanting. Right. So there is conflict because, right, for many years there were strong opinions on both sides of this, and as Steve says, Hawking, about what, ten years ago, eight years ago. Changed his mind. Well, the, the, the beginning is sharp. Hawking wrote this paper. The end is, it's, it's, you know, it's, in some ways, it's still ongoing. We just had this program here in which people are trying to understand this issue. Um, I mean, one of the, I mean, it had, well, it, in some ways, the central issue was kind of abstract. Mm -hmm. um, although, again, the, for those of it, it's important because it's, you know, what is quantum mechanics. Well, it's a challenge to the foundations of yeah. current physics. The most basic foundations of current physics are in conflict. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it led to. Can you just elaborate on that for a second? Well, so we have a way of describing basically all phenomena uh, at the underlying level that we see in nature in terms of what's called quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. And quantum field theory is based on some principles, quantum mechanics, uh, locality, notion that you know, things that are separated don't immediately communicate, uh, and uh, basically the principle of relativity, um, special relativity, mm -hmm. which involves some mathematical apparatus. Those are the principles that underlie quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. And when you try to uh, uh, think about what happens with black hole evaporation, uh, it seems to lead to a conflict between those basic principles. One of them or more has to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that could be, it looks to many of us uh, as if it is, as big as the uh, set of problems that occurred at the turn of the uh, 20th century when you know, classical physics looked great, it, it described everything nearly perfectly, except, well, there were these little problems here and there with the atom and stability and various <clears throat> other things. And by the time we finished unraveling that story, classical mechanics had been completely overthrown, and uh, quantum mechanics had to be invented to. So you think this is as big as that? I mean, looking back, that looks pretty big, right? Sure does. Like super big. I, I don't know if others feel this way, but it, it certainly You all think that small. way? We don't have the resolution to the story yet. That's yeah. the one problem with the storyline. <laughs> this is one challenge is that we may be seeing, uh, we have some indications of what happened to quantum mechanics in the We have some indications possibly about the resolution, but the full resolution is not yet complete. Uh -huh. I mean, one of the outcomes is this holograph. I mean, the, the, is the holographic principle. Yeah. Well, and there's controversy there. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, but, but there's a better word. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, you know, I have to say, yeah. I put up with Brian through all of string theory, where he's telling me that time doesn't really exist, all this other stuff that's really bending my mind. But the holographic theory, that was like almost too much for me. It was kind of a last minute addition. I was like, mm. Well, there's too much for some but, but people <laughs> loved it. Yeah, which shows you you don't always need to know the outcome. No. In fact, it's better to speculate, don't you think? You don't have to, doesn't have to yeah, be. Yeah, I mean, you said earlier, you don't do respective mm-hmm. things, but this is mm-hmm. far removed That's from applications. Right. And so, Joe, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, 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 I'm just still thinking. I mean, there's one piece of, so, so for Brian, you had his books, there's one piece of source material here. Uh, Lenny Susskind, who is one of the main people who sort of been the alternative view mm-hmm. to Hawking's, has this book, uh, The Black Hole Wars, My Battles to Make the World Safe, My Battle with Stephen Hawking to Make the World Safe for Quantum Mechanics. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I think I just looked this up, it's 160,000 on the Amazon list, so he doesn't he doesn't write as well as he speaks. Okay. But um, when you could say that the solution he advocates, you know, there are a certain number of people who buy that, but it's not it's not sorted out, and no, it's not no, uncontroversial no. As, as well. Right, but the holography is something which certainly is true at some mathematical. I mean, ADS-EFT is, is a you know is a is a is a, is a true thing. Um, We're trying to figure out what it means. Right, right, but but, but it could be you know it, it, well. I don't want to get too technical, but but um, you know we're, one is one is using it to to, to calculate um, you know what's seen in heavy ion collisions. Mm-hmm. I mean there is actually a kind of experiment at the very end. Yeah, that's well. Um, that's applied ABS here. Right, right, but it's it's, it's, Again, it's using it's using. You're seeing controversy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. It's well, see, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> On this topic, I'm sold. And why am I sold? You know. I'm sold because I feel like it's a huge idea. And I think our viewers love big ideas, and I kind of love them too. So even though I have to admit from the journalistic perspective, I mean, it would take much more digging. It's going to take a lot of money because it's a very, um, it would be a very graphics rich show. But this is a big, a huge idea, and when you say things like we could be entering a time like that when class, we realize that classical mechanics is breaking down, that kind of gets my juices flowing, I have to say. So you can start to see how an executive producer really thinks, because it sounds like a program for the age. How would you develop a complex idea like this? I mean, I mean. Well, I called Joe McMaster, first of all, and say, OK, here's a really interesting topic that I think you could handle. You have to have someone who can handle the topic, someone who, know, not necessarily a scientist, but somebody who feels comfortable in this terrain, who can deal with Lenny, mm-hmm. who is a character, too, but not the easiest person in the world to deal with, and who can figure out a way to develop this into a story. But the public loves black holes. It, it, it tickles the imagination. You really want to think about it a lot. Um, and I know it's in the wheelhouse of our audience. So what I would do is for this one, because you know, some, a lot of this is instinct and experience. Can you just, you can kind of feel a good story. Um, so I can feel, like the graphene one, I'm really listening to what you say, but I still need to be convinced that, and I'm, don't yell at me, okay, but that it's more than a kind of a cool application. I need to see the big idea aspect of it um, to feel that I can make more than a segment of it. That doesn't mean, first of all, I'm wrong a lot of the time. Second of all, I can play with an idea for several months and then come to the conclusion that we should do it because it just I don't understand enough about it, I don't know enough about it, which, which is certainly the case with graphene. This one, because I went to some of the talks and I heard them and I talked to you, it's kind of a more familiar idea to me, but that big idea aspect of it makes me love it. And love is important because you have to live with these things for a long time. And I think, do I actually want to watch, you know, I'll 
want to walk into a screening on this topic because I have to live with these and watch them over and over and over again. And the answer for me is yes. And happily, it is for my audience, too. So I would try to, to answer your question more directly. I would get a producer I feel could handle the content. And then he would start talking to you and find the story. Then somewhere after maybe four or five weeks of research, he would write a concept paper, which answers the basic question, what's the story here? What am I going to see? And who are the characters? And at that point, on a story like this, we'd probably make a definite decision to go ahead. Because it's pretty cheap to have somebody work for a month. Um, but that's how I would, and I would read it. I'd get Lenny's book. I'd look at it. Um, so, um, but it, it wouldn't be too hard to sell. And it, there's a tremendous fallback because you can always go in the other direction with black holes, which I know would work. Also, there's another tie-in, which mm -hmm. is to the beginning of the universe, inflationary cosmology, and so on. Unraveling these principles and these laws, which again, we seem to have- You said that's a tie-in because it's a similar kind of singularity? Is that- Yeah, there's, well, it gets into uh, the basic issues of the quantum mechanics of gravity, which we have to deal with mm -hmm. to describe the beginning as well as the interior of a black hole. And the conditions would be the same in the Big Bang? Is that or Not identical, but similar. similar. Mm -hmm. Can I, so let me just. So there are similar mathematical issues mm -hmm. and so on as well. Yes. Can I, can I challenge you a little oh, bit on absolutely. this? Absolutely. Um, with all due respect to my colleagues, but it's it's programs such as this which always occasionally put me off Nova, I think, uh -huh. for the following so reasons. There's, there's various reasons for uh -huh. this. Uh, one of the reasons has to do with something that Feynman once said when he was giving popular lectures and I was being asked all kinds of questions uh -huh. by people. And he was he was amazed at all these questions from these people coming like, what's the what's happening at the edge of the universe? What's the beginning of time? What's the latest efforts in unifying gravity with quantum mechanics? These questions. And he was always like, why do you want to know these things? You don't even know anything about all the stuff we already know something about. Why do you always ask me things about stuff we don't know anything about? That's, that's one thing. The other thing is, since we are at the edge... So you're kind of taking issue with this whole big idea. I'm, I'm sort of taking... I, I like big ideas, but as, as Mark so nicely pointed out, we don't know the answer yet. We do know the answer to the quantum mechanics story, so that's why we can tell a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Right now, what's happening, and I, again, I see this too many times in these shows, and Brian Greene does the very same thing. When we're coming to the edge of what we know, we start to speculate. So there's a huge amount of speculation that goes there. And every time I see a quantum mechanics story, and then someone tells tells me entirely confidently about, let's say, multiverses and parallel universes, as if this is established stuff in the community, I'm, I'm being ticked off because it's not. But, but it's being told as if every scientist agrees that, yes, that's the way of doing it. And again, Feynman would say there's more than one way to skin a cat. So, so you can come for my controversy in science talk, because we're going to talk about that. <laughs> so you can join David and really... No, but if evolution is the topic, then the problem is that kind of there's a disconnect between science okay. and, 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 the, and, and the rest of the population. Okay. Here the thing is, so the scientists don't yet agree what okay. the right answer is. And those are all very fascinating questions. Mm -hmm. well, my, my, my wonder is that there's this entire universe of physics that's exciting, and the ordinary person on the street knows like that much about it. But what we're going to tell them about it is the outermost fringes we are not quite but sure But that would be a stuff. failed program, I think. And here's what I think is, you have to ask a question that resonates to the audience. The audi you know, television is voluntary. No one makes you sit down and watch it. This isn't school. You don't have to watch the program. It's not an assignment. So you have to ask a question. When I talked about relevance before, relevance to us is not a gadget. Relevance to, to for my viewers is you have to ask something that engages the audience intellectually for some people, emotionally for other people, but in some way engages them. You only use that question and that kind of big idea as a portal, as a doorway to get in. And if you're not presenting some actual physics in it, you're not actually telling the audience about some aspects of the science, and you're not telling them something about the process of thinking about it. How do scientists actually think about it? And even the controversy, then you failed in the 
program. Then it's a program about philosophy or religion or something like that, or just kind of bullshit. And um, and so I don't really like those kind of programs. But I think that you have to you have to frame the topic in a way that people feel that you are giving them, you're meeting them where they are. And that is, people do think about these things. Well, that, that would be one of my questions. I mean, uh, clearly you have to make a program that people want to watch. So there are two things you can do. You either can ask people, well, what are you interested in? And then undoubtedly, that's what they're going to be interested in. Mm -hmm. Or you decide, well, also, I mean, what should they be interested in? And then you try to make a program that so they will be interested in this kind of stuff. There's so much stuff out there which matters for their daily life, for their for their voting habits, for all kinds of things right. that involve science they know very little about. Well, here, I mean, you have examples in climate change, for example. I was just at the National Academies, and they had a conference, a, a, a two-day conference featuring social scientists, which is an enormous departure for the National Academies. But it was about how do you frame climate change so that people will Think about it, because it totally failed so far. It's just not on anyone's radar screen. Well, it's on some people's radar screen. In California, probably more than most. But it's not on most people's radar screen. It's just not a preoccupation to most people. And that's because, and I know we've done 13 programs on some aspect of climate change, and universally, no one watches them. In some sense, I mean, this is special yes. because it's such a controversial topic. Right. Well, but now what the social scientists would tell you is we just haven't framed it right. You have to frame it correctly. So people don't want to think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. They just, that's, it's like thinking about cancer and Alzheimer's. They just don't want to think about it. So how can you frame it? You can frame it, and I don't know if they're right, and I'm not defending the social scientists, as here's a new way we can improve our economy by creating green uh, energy. So they try to frame it in, or for the fundamentalists who are often against climate change, we, our responsibility to God is to have stewardship of our earth. So they're thinking that it's all in the way you frame it. I personally haven't found that because I've framed these 13 shows just about every way you can frame them. <laughs> Nobody watches them, so it's like I haven't succeeded in that. So I'm not sure whether, you know, the American public, they're actually not stupid. And so it's hard to fool them. But what I'm saying is I think if you frame, if you frame shows around big questions, whether or not you can answer them, it gives a, and if those questions are slightly more philosophical, or as philosophical, if they're a language that people can understand. Um, you know, if I start out talking about Hawking radiation, nobody's going to watch my person. They don't know what it is, and they don't know how to think about it. You have to meet them where they are, hold their hand, and walk through a topic that is going to be very difficult. But I agree with you in the sense that if you're not presenting some basic physics along the way and you're not showing the process of thinking about this, you're, then your program, I hate those programs too. I do. I, really I, I think do. there's some, some uh, sort of sense that it's much easier to hook audiences on high energy and astronomy as opposed to condensed yeah. matter. And uh, those of us in Kinetics Matter, I think, sometimes feel unfairly uh, underappreciated <laughs> because you know somehow you say all oh, at the beginning of time, and sort of everyone says, you know, oh wow, oh wow, but you know, plastics. Well, hey, you know, everyone loves that. Everyone loves that iPod. People loved it. They were the crazy stuff. Yeah. making stuff. They loved it. Who would ever think that a series on material science could work? I didn't even know what it was when we started it. So um, let me, as I want everybody to be heard. Are there other topics that are burning in your hearts? Yeah. You're talking about uh, uh, climate, but climate prediction is something that, that people are interested in. And it's connected, of course, to chaos and the butterfly effect and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there was an article in yesterday's uh, uh, Los Angeles Times, I guess, about uh, this, this incredibly massive new computer and calculations that are going to be done in Wyoming or 
Montana is somewhere in, in They have a computer in Montana? And it's going to contribute to global warming. <laughs> Weather or climate prediction? Climate, I trust. Well, yeah, I, I get. I suppose both, but it's a particularly catastrophic climatic events like hurricanes. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but not only that. That's interesting. Yeah. That might be a good way in. You might want to explore how important hurricanes are, in fact, or whether there's any relation between hurricanes and global warming. Right. I'm, well, you'll get I'm teaching a class in which, in which global warming is like, it's, we have three hours about global warming. And I spend almost all of that time just debunking some of the stuff that people bring up as evidence for global warming in the everyday discussion, which are not evidence for global warming. And the terrible thing about this is that it's known to the scientists that they're not evidence for global warming. But if, 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 if it's told by some advocates of the thing, and then someone else debunks that, then everyone thinks, okay, now global warming is debunked. You just had brought up very bad evidence on the table. So you have uh -huh. to bring the right evidence to the table, and the right evidence is difficult. So you need you need to think of it. So more. are you a climate change skeptic? No, I'm not a skeptic. Did, did, did it sound like a skeptic? Well, when when I I could come up with a whole bunch of examples that are being issued on the street on a regular basis as support for climate change which are wrong. And everyone in the field who is a climate scientist knows they are wrong. It's a terrible disservice to the debate to bring these things over and over again. A good example is this, Antarctica is melting. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, but every model we have about climate change should predict that there should be more snow in Antarctica, not less snow. So the fact that Antarctica is melting contradicts every prediction we have about it. It's a bad, it's an embarrassing thing. Right? So we can't go ahead and what say- What about Greenland glaciers? Is that, what about the I know much countries? less about Greenland than that. Pardon me? I know much less about the Greenland. Uh -huh. I've just made one example. One thing that we could make about this global warming thing is rather than just the usual thing about how bad it all is, how difficult it is really to come up with a good view about it. And that, I think we do have a view about it, but it's much more subtle and it relies on a lot of very careful thinking and modeling in order to understand it's not nearly as clearly said as, as like 100% or 0%. But the IPCC had, has put confidence levels on their data. It's not all sure. I mean, these, these are pretty scary confidence levels, which means you, you probably would have to act. If I was, you're probably going to die tomorrow with 80% accuracy. You probably do something about it and not say, oh, let's get a second opinion and a third and a fourth. Because 80% is still large. You can't just say, oh, I'm not going to do anything about mm -hmm. it. But why we believe in these things is much more complicated. And a lot of people who act as just want to dismiss the whole climate problem, they just have an easy job of just picking a little tidbit here, a little tidbit here, and tearing it down. And the public thinks, oh, well, that means the whole thing is torn down. Scientists have all this bogus information. Scientists know <laughs> That there's much, I mean, a lot of stuff in Elgin. But you say yourself that the scientists are giving us evidence for global warming things that are really questionable. Well, no, things no. which come with arrow bars, things that, which come with uncertainty. A lot, of, a lot of this has to do with appreciating uncertainties in modeling, uncertainties in data, mm -hmm. disagreement about how to analyze an unbelievably complex set of data. It's not just someone looked to a microscope and bam, there's the answer. This is really, really complicated. So data analysis is a major part of the story. So if someone has a different data analysis than someone else, and, then, and people are hitting on each other because you should never Ever do it like this, and then you're falsifying your data. No, I have a different analysis model. Well, the whole thing with the word trick, wasn't it? The yes. word trick that oh, was in these emails and got some it. trick to analyze something, and the, the, that we was have to talk about this more afterwards. Because I, I, you know, I, I think that that, kind, that level of disagreements yeah. and this whole issue of uncertainty is extremely confusing to the public and creates a lot of distrust. And I think it's one of the reasons why the climate issue has, it's a real failure of communication. Because I think the public feels that the scientists aren't really being straight with them. Because it doesn't also help with being all over again. lying on the house floor. It is the smoking it's the smoking thing. being all over again. It's going to take 20, 30 years to work itself. Mm -hmm. So does anybody have an idea that they're sitting on that, um, I, yeah? I, I don't have an idea, but uh, I'm just very annoyed by it the comments that, that cancer doesn't make a good program because <laughs> having physics and mathematics of cancer workshop right now. Right. I didn't say it didn't make a good program. 
I said it's, it's hard to get people to watch it. But but it seems to me that you know like when you really look into cancer, you actually find that like, you know kind of similarity between developmental process, which you bring kind of really biology into the focus. I think mm -hmm. so. You kind of dig deep into what's happening, mm -hmm. and you find out like some aspects of development biology that mm -hmm. is really important in cancer. Uh, that's one thing. But the other thing is that if you kind of look cancer from totally different aspects, of looking at like you know physical principles or pressures, and come up with totally different ideas, which might actually bring like uplifting treatments or something like that that might influence people's mm -hmm. lives. You know, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Just no, I I agree with you. I mean, I think it's it's. Because I think you deal with basics of biology, and now biology meets physics, right, right. it should be, the potential should be there to make a, a really interesting program. Now, development and rheology is actually a topic area which kind of, you know, resonates with this subject area that does work for an audience. You know, the problem is you can't argue with your audience. As much as you'd like to, you look at the yeah, ratings okay. and you want to say, "What idiot? You know, <laughs> did they know how good this was?" <laughs> and you know, sometimes, um, sometimes you have we have programs on. I was there was one program I thought was so awful. We acquired it because some of our programs we acquired. It's kind of an end of the year program, and I didn't. It was a there were there have been. Um, three novas in all these years that I just actually never looked at because I just thought they were so dumb they made me sick and I just let um, my staff deal with it. So I'm on the exercise machine at the gym around Christmas time and I'm watching this nova comes on and I'm watching it. It's like this is the stupidest program I've ever seen. This is really horrible. And you know, and then, you know, I see the ratings come across the next morning. I mean, I was embarrassed about it, and, you know, it does great. And um, and so you can't argue with your viewers. You know, they vote with the clicker. <laughs> Even though you might like to, sometimes they like programs we think are idiotic, and other times, although we don't like to put on programs that we think are idiotic, but you don't love all your children equally in this. I, th I think okay. I have a solution for that problem. Yeah. I mean, as you, as you said, there's all this wonderful, interesting mathematics and physics and biology behind all these processes that you guys in the physics and mathematics of cancer study. Why not just talk about these things without mentioning cancer? I, 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 bet, I bet you something that ha at least half of the people in your field would happily be working on these things into the future, even if cancer is cured, because they're exciting. But I agree and since yeah. probably 50% yeah. of all the audience are secret hypochondriacs that do not want to know all the terrible ways they could die, just tell them about the wonderful <laughs> things that you discover in these things, like how cells communicate, how cells do apoptosis and just bring a sunburn, as an example, or not that not cancer fine. and they're, they're going to love it because you, they don't realize that you tell them how they could go. I mean, I think that's a great idea. We we've done programs. I mean, we did a program called What Darwin Never Knew with Sean Carroll, which is really about gene regulation, and it's kind of like okay, gene regulation is pretty. It was very very difficult science. Sean Carroll. It was a two-hour Sean, yeah, not the physics. Sean Carroll. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What? One from the uh, yeah. University of Wisconsin and HHMI. Yeah. And it did great. So I agree with you. If you can find some way to make this look like a basic biological process, um, which when it goes awry can result in cancer, I, I think you, and this is not something I'm saying I'm never going to do another program on cancer. That would be like a horrible thing to say. And I think that sitting in on a few of these sessions has really helped me to see that there is a program there. Um, but I, I think that what you say is true. You have to find a way to go about it so that the minute people think about it, they don't really think of somebody getting chemo because they're just not going to watch it. And, you know, and I mean, some people will, but a lot of people won't. So you have to, you can't argue with them. They're not going to watch what they're not going to watch. And unfortunately, there's nothing I can do to make them, which is very um, too bad, but that's the way it goes. What about the, uh, do you have anything like the, what was it, uh, 
Burke? What was his first name? Uh, James Burke. Connections. James Burke. Connections. So that's my favorite series of Look at all that. time. I have a good, good uh, viewership that must have had. Yeah, it was a long, long, long time ago. Right. Is there something? Did you do something else like that? Well. You know, it does, does everybody know topics. about Connections? This program out of the UK around 1980, Maybe I want to say. I don't think it was that late. I think it, that was probably a repeat. But um, it was wonderful, which is James Burke, this very energetic British guy. First you'd see him in Greece, then you'd see him in Italy, then you'd see him in Antarctica, and you know, all tracing these connections that result in graphene, you know, <laughs> but going like way back to the ancient Greeks. And so I, that's one of my, that was one of the series of, of that, to put it oh, like that. Yeah. But it should be done again. Yeah. Yeah. It should be done again. Uh, I agree with you. That was, I mean, I personally like that better than Cosmos. So right. yeah. um, not everybody agrees with me, but I did. Any other ideas that come to the fore? So let me pitch you, I mean, ask you a couple what you think. Do you think an idea, a show on the Higgs and on the standard model would be a good idea? Is that deep enough? Is it rich enough? Is it the it's right very, time? Very Is it the right time? Yeah, that's my guess. <laughs> In the sense that you could have a resolution <laughs> to at least part of the story fairly soon. End of the yeah. year. That's what they say, right? End of what? The standard the model year. Higgs, yeah, Higgs, end of yeah. the year. But if it's a non-standard Higgs or you know, something, there are various possibilities here. So, uh, so I would, my thoughts would be uh, that is a very important question, uh, but it's one where we're just you know, on the cusp of uh, finding something important out. Very important question, whether the standard model still yeah, whether the standard model still holds, whether there is a Higgs or something else, um, we seem to be not finding supersymmetry yet, but there's, there's still a lot of place for it to hide. Mm -hmm. this is story, but, but either way, the story could totally change in December in the middle of production, which yeah, would that's be disappointing. The thing. <laughs> yeah, we're in, but there is an actual, well, the LHC is going to run until the end of the year, and then they're going to shut down for a while because they need to do all those repairs to get it up to 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's all. Well, that would be the hiatus, yeah. That yeah, that, that's a natural time. Mm -hmm. It's also not necessarily a happy story, so we don't yet know which direction to pitch it, right? Well, I, yeah, it may be that they, what if they don't find the standard model hits? And then that's, there are hints at 125 GDV, but they'll be happy with someone. Some people regard that as a discovery, uh, but. So there'll be a, we should be prepared for a lot of controversy around whatever they say. It, there may be a clear signal, in which case it will, everyone will be very excited. Mm -hmm. But you or can't you can't write the story now. That's the problem. Yeah. You yeah. don't know. No, that's very <laughs> scary when you can't. Okay, what about gravity waves? Is that part of the story on and LIGO? Is that a story? Has there been any reason that I'm not aware of? I've had that pitched to me by a physicist and one that I really like. But what I mean is, I mean, gravity waves have been predicted decades and decades mm -hmm. and decades ago. I mean, mm -hmm. we want to see them at some point. Right. So is well, there any new development? The well, satellites are We're getting there. close. We're getting close on the scale of, I think, what, years or something. Um, we may well be able to start seeing them. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it's a, it is a fascinating subject because it opens up a whole new way of looking at the universe, uh, both astrophysical objects and the potentially the early universe. So it's, uh, it's a subject with a lot of content. Mm -hmm. And the devices being developed are certainly remarkable in scope. Yeah, and they're, yeah they're huge scale, you know, these sort of miles across. And so on. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have any relationship with what we were talking about before about gravity. No. no. Small. It, it's one window possibly to the early universe, but it's that's a little bit of a remote okay. okay, well, thank you very much. These are great ideas. I appreciate it. I'm here for three more weeks, so if something comes into your head that you want to talk to me about, you know, my office is um, first one on the right upstairs, and just come by or leave me a note on the bulletin board, and I'll get in touch with you. So thanks very much. And I'm giving one more talk on the 25th of June on controversy. We'll talk about that.